Hello, this is Pat Hindle, editor of Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar in our RFM Microwave training series. Today's topic is bonding layer material selection for use in high-performance multi-layer circuit board design, thermal set, and thermoplastic options. Presented by Joe Davis, Technical Service Engineer at Rogers Corporation. This webinar will last about an hour with the first 45 to 50 minutes for presentation. The rest of the hour will be done answering your questions. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation. Just use the Q&A box in the WebEx website. Please address your questions to all panelists, which is the default setting. This webinar will be recorded and available for replay in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. It usually takes about 24 hours for it to be posted from the conclusion today. Determining which bonding layer material to use in high reliability, multi-layer circuit design can be a challenging task. Electrical and mechanical compatibility with a given base material requires consideration of a number of key properties that contribute to the overall performance and reliability. Controlled impedance in a strip line construction is a fundamental consideration of multi-layer board design. Dielectric constant thickness and spacing are also critical attributes. The choice between using thermoplastic films or thermal setting prepegs is generally based upon the compatibility and performance requirements related to the base dielectric material. However, complicating the electrical selection process are mechanical trade-offs and fabrication techniques that can affect the finished board's mechanical reliability. In this webinar, Rogers will discuss bonding layer material properties commonly used in high-frequency, high-reliability applications and how the material selection and fabrication process affect the electrical and mechanical performance of the finished board. Our speaker today is Joe Davis. He holds a BS in Management and University Certification in Project Management. Joe is a Technical Service Engineer for Rogers Corporation, providing internal and external PCB fabrication and design support. He's a member of several industry committees with over 25 years of experience in laminate manufacturing, quality assurance, and technical service supporting printed circuit board materials. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Joe. Okay, I want to thank you all for attending this morning. We have uh, a lot of information to cover, so let's just jump right into it. Um, as previously uh, mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about the difference between some thermoplastic and thermoset bonding layer materials, touch on the electrical and mechanical properties, and some rationale why you might select one over the other. Uh, we'll also discuss reinforced and non-reinforced systems and what the definition is of reinforced and non-reinforced. Uh, board design considerations. Briefly on lamination parameters, uh, we don't want to get too uh, far down in the weeds on some of these topics, and then we'll touch on reliability. Thermoplastic polymers and bond films, when when we often think of thermoplastic materials, we think of soft polymers that basically transition into a viscous phase above a, a specific temperature, and then the material will solidify uh, when cooling. So thermoplastics, commonly we think of products like PTFE and bonding films, FEPs, and, and uh, other types of bonding films like the uh, trichlorofluoro bonding films. Uh, the bonding films and PTFE products, they do, they do not have a glass transition temperature, per se, as a thermoset material will. But the transition temperature is really marked at, by the point at which you change from a liquid to a solid state, basically the material melt point. One of the issues with thermoplastics is if you are attempting to use them in some type of sequential lamination type process in a multilayer board construction, the materials will remelt when the melt point temperature is reached. So that is a limiting factor in a lot of design use for thermoplastic polymers. Thermoset polymers and prepregs are, are often uh, commonly used. When we think of thermoset materials, they're generally pliable or loosely cross-linked products below the glass transition temperature or basically when the material reaches its cure point or its stage point at which it, it freezes in place. 
the glass transition temperature is, is really defined at the point at which the molecular cross-linking, or as we commonly say, the curing reaction occurs, which is a, a thermal and chemical reaction in most resin systems. The advantage of thermoset materials is when the, the glass transition temperature is reached during a second period or third period, as seen in sequential laminations, the materials will not remelt and they should stay in their steady state at a fully cured state. So basically the difference between thermoplastics and thermosets is that we, we think of the thermoplastics as having a melt point. For example, the melt point of PTFE materials, 620 degree Fahrenheit, which is a, a very high temperature for most circuit board uh, materials. During the lamination process, when we develop a core or, or a prepreg material, core being the, the copper clad laminate itself, we basically melt the PTFE above, its, above the uh, melt point and under time, temperature, and pressure, we densify the product and given specific filler mechanisms, the glass content, uh, the resin system and type, you know, resin to glass ratio, we can then densify the material and determine the dielectric constant properties of the material. Uh, a thermoset material, which has a glass transition temperature, uh, we, we generally, you know, cross-link the material, it goes through a curing process, and once that curing process occurs, the material is, is in a rigid state, and it will stay in that rigid state, you know, at most reasonable operating temperatures. So in thermoplastic materials, we often refer to those as soft substrates or thermoplastics. The thermoset materials we often refer to as a, a rigid substrate or a thermoset material. When we look at the glass transition temperature of several of the thermoset products, we'll see this, the hydrocarbon materials. Those are uh, like a Rogers ceramic hydrocarbon would be a Rogers 4000 type product. Uh, the glass transition temperature is, is 280 degrees C, which is relatively high. And then in kind of a digressing order, you have polyimide materials at 260 degrees C, uh, cyanate esters, uh, the BT epoxies, multifunctional epoxies, polyesters. Uh, so we have various glass transition temperatures uh, for the different base material constructions. And then when you get to the PTFE materials listed, there is no glass transition temperature. The transition is defined by the melt point of the resin system. When you consider electrical properties for different bonding layer materials, the thermoplastic bond films typically have a, a very low dielectric constant. They're approximately around 2.0 dK, tested at, at 1 megahertz. They also have very low dissipation factors at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.002, typically also tested around 1 megahertz. When you get into the thermoset prepregs, uh, the dielectric constants, of course, have a wide range when you consider all the different types of thermosets available. You have dielectric constants that range from 3 to 5 as typical values. Dissipation factors generally range from 0, 0, 0,03 to 0, 0,18. And of course, one of the, the prime considerations when you look at those values is the test, test method and the operating frequency where the materials are tested. Uh, dielectric strength is also a critical factor in selection of the multilayer bonding material. FEP is an example, is, is about 1,800 volts per mil. Most of the thermoset products, or many of the thermoset products, run about 750 volts per mil. Um, so in looking at, at more in-depth dielectric constant values in comparison of the dielectric constants, of course, we have the columns of the different resin systems, the dielectric constant values are listed, but what's important to note is the test frequency. For instance, the PTFE materials and the ceramic filled materials that are hydrocarbons are tested at, at 10 gigahertz. Many of the other products are tested at one megahertz. Important to note because if you're selecting materials based on electrical properties between the core material and the bonding layer material, 
you should also note the operating frequency to really get the, the best electrical compatibility that you can between the different layers of your multi-layer board. The same advice is recommended for loss tangent comparisons. Of course, all the material types are listed in the left column. The dissipation factors or, or loss tangent is listed in the center column. But once again, looking at the, the test frequency is very critical to the selection process. For instance, if you look at the, the cyanate ester product in the center of the page, the dissipation factor at 1 megahertz is 006. But of course, as you get up into frequency, you're, you know, you're generating more power, you're generating more heat, the loss factor goes up, and at 10 gigahertz, the dissipation factor is 0.015. So I guess the key takeaway from, from these slides is really that you need to look closely at the data sheets presented by all the, all the laminate producers, you know, Rogers and, and others, to make sure that you're selecting the best compatibility match for electrical properties as you can. And of course, when you're going through that selection process, you know, looking at the electrical considerations, there are several impedance simulators that are available that allow you to, to model the impedance and loss factors based on the dielectric constant, the dissipation factor, the, the operating frequency, the spacing or thickness between the layers. Of course, you're generally targeting a 50 ohm impedance line in strip line constructions, and so those are the, the critical factors that you would consider. Um, matching electrical properties in a homogenous type of construction is, is of course, of, of benefit, and by you know, homogenous construction, that would be the, the same resin system throughout the material. Um, Rogers Corporation has a, a software program called MWI, Microwave Impedance, which can simulate the electrical properties based on the core and the bonding layer materials. When we look at the mechanical properties, um, we, we most often consider the coefficients of thermal expansion. And when you look at the different laminate manufacturers' data sheets, most all of them list the, the X and Y and Z axis CTE coefficient of thermal expansion. And so if we look at, just as an example of PTFE, the PTFE resin system, the coefficient of thermal expansion is 100 to 150 parts per million per degree C. And of course, the, one of the other key components is the electronic grade glass, the ceramic filler types that are used, and probably one of the most important factors is the copper cladding. We know that copper cladding moves at 17 parts per million, Almost all of our core materials are bonded with copper cladding, and of course that becomes very important because as the CTE of the dielectric changes uh, based relative to the copper cladding, if the dielectric is greater than the copper cladding, the CTE of the dielectric is greater than the copper cladding, you'll typically see shrinkage when you go through the image and etch process and the thermal excursions that you see in multilayer lamination. If the CTE of the dielectric is less than that of the copper cladding, you'll typically experience growth through those subsequent processes. In dielectric materials where the CTE is matched to that of copper, or there is considered very little to no dimensional change, then you should experience much less movement through the image and etch process and through the multilayer board lamination process. And of course, one of the, the factors we'll talk about is the prepregs and resin systems used as the multilayer material will also can push and move the, the core dielectric materials basically thickness dependent. So when, when you're looking at the CTE values and different producer data sheets, um, the closer that you are to the copper 17 parts per million, most likely the lower the amount of dimensional change or movement that you'll see through the processing and through the lamination process. And of course, that affects the registration of your interconnects, your annular ring, your different breakouts, and those other types of, of uh, board attributes. The Z-axis CTE is, is one of the prime considerations for multilayer board configurations. When you look at PTFE ceramic type products, which are, you know, 
really uh, the, the basis of high-frequency materials. Um, from an IPC perspective, the 4103 committee, we kind of determined that a dissipation factor less than 005 would be considered a high-performance material. Um, PTFE ceramic materials, you know, fit into that category as well as most of these are versions of these products. So when we look at the, P the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion in the Z-axis, 24 parts per million per degree C is actually relatively low. So if you consider stacking up dielectric layers and bonding them together and drilling a hole and plating a hole and solder stressing that hole, thermal shocking the hole, the thermal reliability is, is fairly low. At least the Z-axis expansion and the way the material changes and expands in the Z-axis should be lower. It doesn't mean that these other products that have Z-axis CTEs in the, the 50 range or even 100 range, 150 range cannot be used in multi-layer board constructions. It just means that you may need to consider what types of fabrication processes and what types of in-use thermal excursions that the products will experience in, in the active application. And of course, there are a number of, of bonding layer materials available, as noted by the, the number of products in the, the slide. So if we look at a, a typical hybrid multi-layer board, we'll see the, the RF materials with an RF adhesive layer or prepreg is generally bonded in one lamination cycle, and that construction is then bonded sequentially to a second uh, set of materials that could be a thermal set material, an FR4, an RO4000 type product that carries the analog signal. So this is probably one of the most common multi-layer board construction seen in the industry where you're using the RF material on the cap layers and then the DC or analog material in the bottom layers. It doesn't mean that that's the only type of multi-layer board that, that can be built or is experienced. If you look at the hybrid constructions available, there are many constructions that are PTFE FR4, PTFE hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon FR4, hydrocarbons with polyimides, PTFEs with polyimides, LCP material with PTFE, LCP hydrocarbon, and then, of course, homogeneous constructions where you have pure hydrocarbon, pure FR4, pure PTFE, and PTFE materials that are bonded with thermoplastic films are somewhat considered homogeneous type constructions. When we consider the, the reinforcement mechanisms for these products, some products are, are reinforced with random glass shards of material that are added to the resin system. Some products are reinforced with ceramic filler particles. Some of the products are reinforced with woven glass and ceramic particles. Uh, the hydrocarbon ceramic and glass is available. PTFE ceramic is also available with limited glass, which you know, tends to offer a, a little higher uh, electrical performance than some of the other grades. So when we look at one of the products that's just PTFE random glass, this is Rogers RT Duroid 5880 material. And what you see is a cross section of the composite which shows the, the glass shards that are used for the reinforcement. And this product basically has one of the tightest dielectric constants and one of the lowest dissipation factors you know, in the industry. However, with the reinforcement mechanism and the CTE values that the PTFE and the random glass generate through the um, thermal excursions, there's quite a bit of Z-axis expansion. So the, the Z-axis expansion of this product is about 230 parts per million per degree C. At 230 parts per million degree C, it may not be your first choice for a multi-layer board construction, although from an electrical perspective, it's, it's ideal. So I've said somewhat jokingly, the electrical designers would design everything on 5880 or, or similar product, but the mechanical designers would probably design nothing on 5880 mechanical, uh, based on the mechanical attributes. 
having said all that, though, there are this is a, a generational product that's been around for 40 years in the circuit board industry, and there are many legacy designs that have built this composite into multi-layer board constructions. Um, generally speaking, if the the core of the material is relatively thin, if you're putting a 5 to 10 mil core on top of some other hybrid construction, um, it's manufacturable. If, if your desire is to put, you know, 90 mil thick cores together of 5880 material, it can be done, absolutely, although you would have to consider the end-use application and what that 230 part per million Z-axis CTE is going to do during a, any type of thermal cycling and solder shock testing. One of the other uh, prominent grades in the uh, high frequency PTFE market is ceramic filled PTFE. This is a Roger 6002 PTFE ceramic and you can see the, the ceramic filler particles that take up a bulk of the volume of the composite. The ceramic filler particles serve several needs. Generally speaking, you can modify the dielectric constant based on the ceramic filler particles. But more importantly, it's been added to control the, the X, Y, and Z axis CTE. So in products that are ceramic reinforced, we're able to match the X, Y, CTE of, of the uh, dielectric to that of the copper at around 17 part per million per degree C. And the Z axis, we're able to get down to approximately 24 parts per million per degree C. Of course, variations of products will have some variation of those values. But if you consider 24 parts per million per degree C in the Z-axis versus a uh, 230 parts per million per degree C, of course, that might make a much better selection for a multi-layer board. PTFE woven glass is basically PTFE resin that's uh, intermixed with woven fiberglass cloth at different PTFE resin to glass ratios. And of course, adding the PTFE glass adds some uh, dimensional stability in the X, Y, and axis, which again helps control the registration through multi-layer uh, board manufacturing. Uh, the next example is Rogers 4000 material, which is a, a hydrocarbon resin system, but Viewing the cross-section, you also see epoxy systems that look very similar, and basically it's layers of woven glass cloth that are stacked up to build the composite. Um, and some have uh, ceramic fillers. Some products do not have ceramic fillers. And then there are hybrids of laminates, uh, such as the 3203 products, where we limit the number of glass layers, which, again, helps control the registration but you still have the benefit of the electrical properties and the way the electric fields move through the material. Now, I know that's a, a lot of information on core materials. However, um, that does play a role into how the, the materials behave in multi-layer board constructions. If we look at the 3,000 products in the PTFE ceramics, uh, you, if you look at the center of the page where the, the, the X, Y, and Z axis CTEs are presented, the X and Y are, are very closely matched to that of the copper foil. The Z axis is 24 parts per million per degree C. We're able to alter the dielectric constants by adjusting the amount of filler. And we also have versions, as I just mentioned, of the, of the product reinforced with woven fiberglass cloth, which create some stability for dimensional movement through the circuit board process, which i.e. means better registration, but there are some trade-offs with the Z-axis expansion as it may, uh, may increase in value. 58, 45, I would not consider those uh, high values for Z-axis expansion by any means, um, but you can see the benefit of adding that woven glass reinforcement to a non-reinforced product for registration purposes. Also, mechanical strength. If you look at a non-reinforced 3,000 product versus a reinforced 3,000 product, the flexual modulus, tensile modulus, uh, dimensional stability have, have significant differences. And basically, if you increase the strength, i.e. rigidity of the material, then that's a major benefit 
to the board fabricators as they image, etch, and handle this material through processing. And so when the, when the board fabricators come back to you guys at the designer level and they're, they're requesting some reinforcements and, and uh, rigidity, and um, it's, it's really to, to benefit the registration and make the board more manufacturable over time. So I spent a little bit of time there talking about, you know, the, the laminates themselves versus the bonding layer materials. But the laminates, you know, equate to a lot of the, the functional performance of the bonding layer material. So in materials, especially soft materials, the, the thermoplastics, um, if, if you're using materials less than 20 mil, um, it's often a good idea to select a material with a woven glass reinforcement, providing you can manage the trade-off with the Z-axis expansion and the electrical performance, and that will most likely make the board more manufacturable over time. Um, if you're at, at 5 mil and 10 mil dielectric thicknesses, for registration purposes, um, it's, it's always a good idea to use a glass reinforced product like a 3203, 6202, CLTE, et cetera. Um, material movement, a lot of it's caused by the, the handling and manufacturing process. It's something the fabricators, you know, cannot avoid. There are ways that the fabricators can minimize the influence of handling, um, but of course, selecting a material that offers them a benefit is, is of course, a, a major plus. And of course, another factor in, in the design consideration when you're selecting the materials is a copper retention. And again, with rigidity and how the material handles through processing, the copper amount of copper, percent of copper retention um, can benefit the fabricator through that process. So looking a little closer at the bonding layer materials, the thermoplastic films are not reinforced. So generally speaking, there is no ceramic filler. There is no woven glass reinforcement. The thermal set resin materials are generally reinforced with a woven glass structure. Uh, there are thermal set resins, bonding layer materials reinforced with both glass and ceramic fillers. There are thermal set resins reinforced with filler and no glass. And of course, there are high flow, low flow, and no flow uh, resin systems you know, based on these different attributes of the material. And when we consider, you know, uh, high flow, low flow, no flow, and, and the advantages or selection of those different materials, you know, the con contributing factors to a successful board are really how much copper are you trying to fill? Is it a, a half ounce supposing a half ounce inner layer, or are you trying to fill two ounce supposing inner layers? Uh, the copper distribution of the board, the percent of copper retention, you know, has a, a considerable influence on how the resin flows and moves around the board and, and what the uh, fill and spacing will be between your layers. And then, of course, if there are via fill requirements and you're using the pre-preg layers to actually fill the via versus, you know, adding uh, a conductive or non-conductive via, um, you know, that, that also is a contributing factor to how well these bonding layer materials behave and affects the available spacing, which then, of course, would affect your impedance. So as an example of, of what I mean by flow, this is a, a photo of a hydrocarbon ceramic material. There are two bonding layer materials, and in this photo we basically cut out circles of the dielectric uh, bonding layer material. We bonded them together, and then we measured the amount of flow between the two different types of material. You can see in the left-hand column where we where we cut out the circles, the resin is a, a no-flow to low-flow resin system and basically would not fill in the circles. And the photograph on the right, the resin was able to completely fill in the, the same diameter circles. So when you're, you know, considering high-flow, low-flow, no-flow resin systems, you know, depending on your design, there could be designs where a low flow could be advantageous over a high flow and vice versa. Um, generally speaking, if you look at the uh, conductor that's shown in this next photo, this is a two ounce conductor and this is a ceramic filled hydrocarbon prepreg that has filled around that two ounce conductor and filled in at the knee of the conductors and filled the total height of the conductor. When you get into 
three ounce, four ounce, even five ounce type internal conductors, the selection of the bonding layer material based on flows can be very critical. Uh, low flow material trying to fill a, a four ounce internal conductor may present problems. And of course, we don't want to have laminate voids or voids at the knee of your conductor and all of the problems associated with that. Another reason for considering the resin flow in this next uh, photo, it, it demonstrates or illustrates where you have stacked copper features. You have stacked copper layers to the left of the photo, to the right of the photo, next to the plated through hole. And then in the center of, the, of this design, we have an area where there is no copper with copper stacked on both sides of that center area. And in, in a lot of resin systems that are low flow to no flow, where the copper is stacked and the press closes and you can envision the, the lamination process where your pressure builds up on these stacked copper layers, you get less pressure in that center area where there is basically no copper to help support the resin. Um, increasing pressure, adding pressure driving materials, there are a lot of ways to, uh, to help support and get good pressure and densification into those areas so that you don't see you know, voiding or separation, delamination into those low pressure areas. Of course, from a design perspective, the less of those areas that you can design into the board, the less problematic it might be for the fabricators who need to manufacture the board. So uh, when you're selecting these bonding layer materials and, and you're considering how you're stacking up your copper layers, um, you should bear in mind that when you're bonding those materials together, those stacked copper layers are probably going to see the most of the pressure and we like to get good pressure distribution and uniformity so we get good even flow through the, the package and so that our, our bond line in that center area looks like the photo that's illustrated here where everything is bonded well together and there are no signs of voiding, delamination, etc. I mentioned earlier that in, in many applications, the prepreg bonding layer material is also used to fill uh, vias, whether they're blind vias, buried vias, etc. And this is an example. You know, example could be FR4 prepreg. This is a hydrocarbon ceramic example. However, you can see where the the prepreg itself was bonded into the multi layer and was forced up into the holes, and that created a Basically, in this case, a conductive via fill filled all the way to the top of the holes. But that does take away resin from the spacing at the bond line. So in, in some of those types of applications where you're using the prepreg resin to fill vias, you may also need to consider the spacing, perhaps adding more prepreg dielectric layer material at that bond line. Now, the, the fabricators and... and uh, Many of us laminate producers, you know, we've done a lot of work in helping to establish some guidelines for resin flow and prepreg fill. This this slide represents the 2929 bond ply, and there are these are 30 mil thick uh, core constructions, and there are different diameters of holes presented in this slide: a 30 mil hole, 20 mil hole, 10 mil hole, 13 mil hole, and in this case, you can see where the resin filled. Uh, beneath the core, but also adequately filled into the, the via structures that were presented. And so based on these types of evaluations, many of the laminate producers are able to provide uh, some guidance in regard to a core thickness versus a hole diameter, your prepreg or bonding layer material thickness going in, and the actual press thickness com coming out considering how much of that resin will be forced up into the, the via holes for the via fill. Uh, you know, an, another option to that or alternative to that is basically using a conductive or non-conductive via fill product, which the fabricators all basically have in-house or have access to where they will screen in and fill those holes, and then you're not relying on the bonding layer material to fill the vias and the bonding layer material has been a little better controllable for uh, spacing. Speaking of spacing and the 2929 material and, and some of the other products available in the industry, 
This is a, a quick formula that basically allows you to calculate what your press spacing would be after lamination. Of course, spacing again critical to impedance. Um, in this case, it's a four, you know, a four mil dielectric thickness. You take your your copper cladding on an internal layer in the, uh, seven tenths of a mil for half ounce, one point four mil for one ounce. You calculate the percentage of retained copper, whether it's twenty five percent retention, fifty percent retention, etc. And then you can somewhat accurately calculate the core spacing by going through the brief formula here where you're taking your, your thickness and you're multiplying your copper height by the percent of copper retention from side A to side B. And then you get a, a fair calculation of what that press thickness will be, which again helps you to control the impedance. This next slide basically illustrates where the, the thickness of the, the bonding layer material will change. <clears throat> you have the thickness that's between the, the copper conductor and the opposing dielectric, and then you also have some squeeze out of that dielectric thickness that's filling into the, the spaces between where your, your conductor, conductors are running. And of course, and there's there's always the it depends questions, and um, a, a lot of the the information I just showed you on those two slides is based on a given lamination pressure. One of the knobs that the fabricators have to turn on many of the products is the lamination pressure. So if you're you're looking at fill and flow potential of a given resin system, perhaps in a cavity type design. Uh, you can control the amount of flow flowing up to the cavity by adjusting pressure. This slide demonstrates a 2929 product when pressed at 200 PSI versus 400 PSI and the different thicknesses of the resin system. And basically when you're building these cavity designs, your fabricators are, are doing a cutback and they're trying to predict how much of that resin is going to flow up to the edge of that cavity. Or another method is to plug the cavity and then drill out the, the plug in the dielectric material to expose the cavity after lamination. But at, at any rate, uh, considering which bonding layer material you use and, and the potential for flow you know, is a very important consideration and, and often the fabricators may come back with uh, suggestions or recommendations based on how much resin flow might be required both to fill those internal copper heights and in the case of cavity board designs. When we, when we think of, you know, registration and dimensional movement, you know, one of the key components of that is really how much copper retention is left on the board. Uh, this this uh, graph basically shows a four mil thick laminate and the amount of post-lamination movement that you might experience through a lamination process. So a four mil laminate, you may see, uh, given the percent of copper, of course, 25% has less movement than 75% retention. So you could see six tenths of a mil and perhaps more uh, dimensional movement of the core and the bonding layer material through a lamination process. But of course, the more copper that you keep in place on the board, the less movement that the board should realize and of course the, the better the registration or the easier to control the registration. When you get into 20 mil thick laminates, as in this next slide, the, the thickness of the dielectric you know, offsets some of that movement of the core and some of the stresses that are imparted by the bonding layer material and you, you really begin to realize less movement. So as, as most, most fabricators will probably attest that that when they get above 20 mil thicknesses, the compensation becomes less uh, worrisome. It's really in the thinner cores where they may come back and ask to add copper or thieving patterns in, into areas so that they can better control the registration. They may also have to go through some other mechanisms to uh, help control the registration, such as reducing uh, pressure or selection of materials. When, you know, back to stacked copper features, one of the things that most boards can benefit for flatness and thickness control is using a, an offset thieving pattern um, around the border of the material and in between parts. 
So what this this uh, slide basically shows is a layer one to layer two, or in this case layer two to layer three opposing copper conductors or thieving pattern inside of the board. And of course, if, if you stack these up in the same orientation or you have solid copper borders around your board, you create high and low pressure areas. And of course, that can affect the uh, densification of the bonding layer materials. It can affect your registration. So as a general rule, when you're designing your boards, uh, thieving patterns are often determined by the fabricators, but in the board design itself where you can offset the conductor so that they're not opposing each other and creating these stacked copper features, it will generally make the board more manufacturable at the fabricator level and help with the registration and thickness control of the board. One of the, the, the problems, or I guess it's kind of a, an industry standard, is that do we sell boards or do we sell coupons? This next slide industry, uh, illustrates the uh, IPC coupon. And the IPC coupon, of course, has various features designed to capture the reliability of the circuit board, most, most often related to the part itself, not always, but the IPC coupons are a little bit notorious for creating high and low pressure areas around that coupon. I've seen many boards, you know, over time where the coupons themselves create problems because of the pressure differential between the coupon and the, the in this case, you can see the etched dielectric next to that. So you're going from a high pressure area to a low pressure area, and you increase the potential for delamination. That in itself may not be reflective of the part at all. So the fabricators, you know, often need to consider what kind of thieving, and there is an IPC call out for the amount of spacing around the coupon. Um, but that can be a challenge for low flow to no flow resin systems. And uh, again, this is just an image of the thieving pattern with the offsetting dots between the layers to help improve the nesting between the layers and again, Im improve the thickness control and the registration. Nothing against IPC and their coupons, though. So. Do we sell coupons or do we sell boards? And of course, uh, when, you're, when you're building multi-layer boards and you get into matching the CTEs of the products, in a homogeneous construction. Generally, you can minimize attributes like bow and twist by matching the XYCTE, uh, matching the glass transition temperature, which often means that you're also matching the lamination parameters, and matching the dielectric thicknesses. When you have a, a very thick uh, 60 mil, 90 mil thick dielectric on one side of your bonding layer and a 10 mil thick dielectric on the other side of the bonding layer, with, uh, with non-matched CTE values, there's probably a very good chance that you'll end up with some type of bow and twist or warpage on your board. So when the, the board fabricators come back to the designers and, and ask if they can increase spacing or thickness in different layers, often it's to, to help minimize the amount of bow and twist that you'll see in the board. Again, controlling the copper distribution also is a, is a key attribute to controlling the bow and twist. So adding copper to a layer, removing copper to a layer, changing from solid copper to offsetting dots and squares and, and those types of things, you know, are, are all uh, options that the fabricators may recommend to help control the warpage in the bow and twist, which for several reasons is, is important, probably the, the most important being the assembly process. If you have a board that will not sit flat through the assembly process, that will create problems farther down the line, even if it does successfully leave the fabricator site. So fabricators have options. They, they use on different materials, pressure bump cycles, uh, pressure step-down cycles, where you can do a stress relief uh, in, and build that into your lamination cycle, basically a flat bake in the press. Controlling the rate of rise and the cool down can help control the, the warpage and bow and twist. You can do post bakes flat bakes, pre-bakes, you can thermal cycle materials. You know, one of, one of the things about lamination is when you're lamination, laminating at high temperature, high pressure, you're building stresses into the material. And the, the greater the mismatch of the CTE between the copper and the dielectric material, the, the higher the stresses that you're building into the material, the more likely you'll need some stress relief or 
the more likely you'll see material movement when you start etching the copper or going through thermal excursions through the lamination process. So lamination parameters, there, there are so many to talk about, uh, but the three key considerations are really time, temperature, and pressure. Um, these are controlled at the fabricator level. Generally, time is, is somewhat fixed to ensure that you have cure of the material, adequate cure. Uh, the, the temperature can be a major consideration, especially if you're mixing dielectrics and you're mixing uh, bonding layer films and thermal set prepregs. Uh, pressure, as I mentioned earlier, pressure can be adjusted to, to move the resin around and for fill and float uh, potential, uh, pressure is often adjusted. Generally speaking, higher pressure is better but higher pressure can also create problems. Um, so if we consider thermoplastic bond films, the 3001, 6700 options uh, versus an FEP type option, if you look at the melt point of the, the 3001, it's 374 Fahrenheit. The melt point of FEP is 520 Fahrenheit. When you consider the, the legacy designs before we had all of these options of ceramic fill prepregs and and different uh, epoxy prepregs. These thermoplastic films were really the, the workhorse of the industry for the RF, uh, RF multilayer board design. The issues with using these films you know, can be overcome to some degree, but these films are thermoplastic, so they're difficult to build up thickness. It's very difficult to take a one and a half mil ply of, of bonding film and build it up to a six mil spacing. It will generally squeeze out in the press and the spacing will, will uh, be hard to consider or hard to control over time. Um, metal finishes, ironically, is, is also very important. Of course, if you build a, you could build a nice multi-layer board out of 3001 or 6700, and the board will bond together and hold well together, and then with the lower melt point, if the first thing you do is put a hot air solder level finish on it or send it down a lead-free solder reflow line, you'll probably experience some degree of delamination of the circuit board after you've re-surpassed that melt point of the bonding layer film. Sequential lamination is possible and has been possible with the, uh, the legacy type materials, primarily PTFE products, when they're used in combination. So for instance, if, if you're bonding with both FEP and 6700, you could go through your first lamination process with the FEP, at the higher bonding layer temperature and the higher melt point of the, the base film, and then go through a secondary lamination process with a lower temperature film so that you're not remelting the bond line of your, of, your first, uh, of your first lamination process. You know, if the final metal finish is electroless nickel immersion gold or immersion silver, something of that nature, maybe the thermal excursion, isn't as important. If the assembly process is hand soldering, a lot of the aerospace designs, legacy designs, are, uh, are not automated assembly, um, then either film might be appropriate, and they do have the, the better electrical characteristics or lower loss type dielectric constant control. So there are some advantages to using the, the films. However, you know, now there's a variety of, of epoxy prepregs available, some filled, some not filled, so it's a little bit easier to match the electrical properties of the core to the prepreg. Uh, when you're using a, a homogenous construction, you can also match the CTEs in the X, Y, and Z, which gives you better through-hole reliability, easier registration. The same can be said for our products like the hydrocarbon ceramic where you can now match the electrical properties, you can match the CTEs, again, better uh, through-hole reliability and uh, improved registration. PTFE materials, well, you can bond PTFE materials with a variety of systems. So you can bond PTFE, you can do a process known as fusion bonding. Uh, fusion bonding, you're basically surpassing the melt point of the PTFE and you're bonding the cores directly together. Um, in some cases, uh, companies, producers like Rogers will offer a, uh, some increased spacing. We'll, we will offer a non-centered ply that you can place in the opening between your core materials 
to help improve fill around your internal conductors. In some fusion bond applications, basically at high temperature and pressure, the, the conductors are recessed back into the dielectric to some degree and pressed into the opposing dielectric to some degree. And so the spacing is a little more difficult to control. But for fusion bonding, there are no dissimilar materials in that scenario. So the through-hole reliability and over, overall registration and uh, through subsequent thermal excursions and different applications can be much improved. The PTFE products in general, you could bond with the, the thermoplastic films. You can bond with, with LCP products like Ultralam 3908, which is a, a low decay, low loss material. Of course, the 4400 prepregs. And you can bond PTFE products with FR4. Mechanically speaking, you could bond cores of PTFE together you know, all day long and have very good mechanical reliability. The question to ask is, electrically, does it make sense if you're putting a high-loss prepreg in between layers of these low-loss cores if you have interconnects between the layers? If you have copper ground planes isolating the RF from the digital, you can probably get away with that. Um, so I'll often ask, can you use epoxy prepregs with, with high-speed, high-frequency products? The answer is yes, mechanically. The question is, does it make sense electrically? And of course, complicating that scenario is the lamination temperatures. If you're attempting to fusion bond PTFE, you need to be at 700 to 730 degrees Fahrenheit in most cases. Um, in a, a dissimilar construction, of obviously, epoxy materials will not withstand those types of lamination temperatures. So it would truly need to be a, a full PTFE construction. With FEP bond film, we're bonding at 550. Again, that's above the hot air solder level temperatures and, and buys you some leeway uh, in regard to thermal excursions. The Ultralam 3908 materials, they bond at 540 Fahrenheit. And in and, and descending order, the 40, uh, 2929 at 450 Fahrenheit, poly emid, 3,001, 6,700, et cetera. Most epoxy systems and ceramic hydrocarbon bond at 350 Fahrenheit, which is very compatible with the core materials. And again, when you're going through that selection process, you just need to think about, you know, do, does it make sense to match this core with that bonding type material? Um, obviously, if you put a, an epoxy again at, at 700 degree Fahrenheit, the results are not going to be very promising. There's products that also bond at somewhat low temperatures, like the Q-clad, which um, bonds at relatively low temperature. There could be uh, foam-type applications or low-temperature applications that don't require high-temp assembly processes where, uh, where a product like that might become uh, of importance. Of course, all of those different bonding films create challenges for the fabricators. Not all fabricators can get up to 700 degree Fahrenheit or 550 degree Fahrenheit. M many can. Most, most all will do 350 to 500 Fahrenheit. Um, but when you get into the specialty films um, and some of the high temp lamination processes, you do start to, to restrict or limit some of the fabricator availability. And you present new challenges to the fabricators. Do they have the temperature capability, the pressure capability, the uh, press pad capabilities uh, that will withstand those temperatures? Do they have the pressure driving materials to move the resin around in between those uh, conductors and those uh, high and low pressure areas? And of course, then the considerations of routing cavities and resin flow, and, and do you have filled and buried vias? And, and those types of things require sequential lamination. Of course, you fill your via. The via needs to be uh, baked, cured, planarized, um, et cetera, and registration. I guess I'm being a little pressed for time here. So um, we'll, we'll move on to reliability. And speaking of pressed for time, when I started thinking about reliability, there, there are so many different types of test programs and regimens available. I think I mentioned there are six topics in the overview. In reality, you could probably spend an hour on each of those topics rather than trying to squeeze all of those topics 
into a, a one-hour presentation. But generally speaking, with reliability, you know, lead-free reflow temperatures, three to five X passes down a reflow line are, are somewhat standard. Solder shocking, you know, most fabricators have that type of capability in-house. And, and there's a, a litany of different test methods for whether you're looking at etch back or annular rings or through hole reliability and the, the industry standards that really govern those types of tests are the, the UL testing, of course. If a product is UL certified, it's been through a, a variety of long-term thermal aging, a flammability type testing. The, the specification for high-speed, high-frequency materials is IPC 4103 that outlines the test regimen for those products. At the board level, what the fabricators often look at um, is, is IPC 6012, IPC 6018, and those are, are qualification and performance specifications for the rigid board. 6018 is intended for the microwave end board product inspection, and of course that's, a, uh, that's probably one of the most relevant to this discussion. So having said that, um, that brings us to slide 50, which is our final slide. And, um, you know, I want to thank you for, for staying online and uh, listening to my dissertation on these materials. Of course, we, you know, Rogers in general, myself, I'd be happy to talk about any one of these, you know, uh, products or attributes or discussions in more detail at any, any time at your convenience. And um, I'll leave the floor open for questions. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. Excellent presentation and very thorough there. So we do have a, a few questions here, so we can get right to those. Um, if you have a cavity in the top of the circuit board, how do you prevent the prepreg from flowing into the cavity during lamination? Well, one of the probably preferred ways is to plug the cavity. Uh, using a, a PTFE type plug if for high temperature applications. There are also uh, some, some uh, other materials available that can be used for hole plugging materials. Um, PTFE is probably what, what I would recommend, what a lot of fabricators would use. Um, there are some foam products that can also be used that will withstand the lamination temperatures. And, uh, and actually, uh, one of the divisions of Rogers has a product that is often used, a durometer foam, to uh, help fill cavities. Okay, next question. Can you speak more to the reliability slide that you showed? Uh, what type of testing does Rogers support? Well, Rogers, we have a, a variety of, of test methods and packages available, of course, you know, IPC 4103 is what we primarily adhere to and what we certify to on our certificate of compliance. So attributes like DKDF, water absorption, uh, solder, uh, solderability, copper bond strength, dimensional stability, we routinely do those tests every day. And, and part of circuit fabrication support, we also are capable of measuring the Z-axis expansion, the X, uh, XY expansion. We have a variety of, of thermal conditionings that we can do. We support UL testing. Our products that have been submitted to UL have, of course, been through long-term thermal aging and tested for dielectric strength and flexural strength at time and temperature intervals. We have the, the ability to do cath testing, thermal imaging, uh, cross-sectioning of materials. Uh, flexural strength, tensile strength. We have a lot of capability in-house to, to help characterize the products. Okay, another question. Uh, can you talk about sequential lamination? Well, sequential lamination is, uh, as I mentioned, with the, the bonding layer of films, you know, considering the bonding temperature is very critical. You know, the, the older method in legacy materials was to use an FEP at the higher temperature for the initial lamination and come back in a second time with a 3,100 for the secondary lamination. Um, so the, the temperature is, of course, important, but one of the things to consider with sequential lamination and, and thermal set material and thermal plastics 
is that you're probably doing that because you have blind vias and buried vias and you need to go through a, a, a filling and a baking and a curing process and then a, a planarizing or sanding process which can affect the, the copper height and the copper structure between your layers. So when you're going through a sequential lamination, there's a, a lot more work involved with a fabricator. Of course, more, more cost involved with the fabricator. And uh, it's a, this creates a, another set of variables that you may need to control. OK, great. I think we've uh, run out of time here. So I thank you, Joe, for a great presentation. And thanks to Rogers Corporation for supporting this webinar. You can find out more about their company and products at rogerscorp.com. And you can use a slash tech hub for answering questions and getting technical information, which is a great resource. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing later on in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. It will be posted in about 24 hours from now. All that registered will receive an email with a download link to a copy of today's slides. We thank everybody for joining us today.